There I stood, or laid rather, in the middle of an empty forest, looking out upon the maze of trees, bushes, and other shrubbery. My stab wound had been healed completely as if it was never there, but I remembered everything that had just happened, and that this was not reality as I knew it. But after hearing the sudden and blood-curdling scream of a human child, I leapt up, scaling the tree closest to me to get to vantage point to better pinpoint the sound. And as I did, I looked at my arms. They had returned to my original midnight blue pigmentation, along with the rest of my body, and I felt much weaker than before. I was no longer superior brawn, as the orchestrator had dubbed me. But now more than ever, his words meant nothing to me, and I would make sure to put an end to him once and for all when I had regained consciousness. I still had plenty of strength to do so, but first I had to get out of here and do whatever it took to break this curse on my psyche. I had run into beings capable of putting me in vivid dream states similar to this before, so it was nothing new. I was just about halfway up the tree that I was climbing when I felt something grab under my leg from below which was a shock, as I hadn't heard or smelled it coming. So I barred my teeth and growled while preparing for a fight. Whatever it was, sank what felt like a tiny blade into my heel, provoking me to release a snarl as I came crashing down, snapping and tearing away at various branches and leaves as I fell. I hit the ground but was able to recover in a matter of seconds. I quickly got to my feet, looking, sniffing, and listening out for my attacker, but I got nothing for several seconds, prompting me to drop down on all fours and begin moving forward. I had figured that Keller was behind me and that he was up in my head, not controlling it but invading it like an insect. As to what this strange dream reality had in store for me was yet to be discovered. That is, until I yet again heard the terrified cries of a small child coming from deeper into the woods. So I picked up speed, getting into a sprint and dashing between the trees at breakneck speed. I wouldn't stop until I reached it. Branches snapped in my wake. The dirt underneath my claws was sent soaring, as I threw myself forward with all my strength on every stride, not leaving any room to go any faster. And in the midst of my sprint, a sudden and unwavering scent of rotting meat had filled my nostrils, giving me a better idea of the direction to head in. I focused on the scent, following it as directly as possible, keeping aware of my surroundings while doing so, and soon enough, I came to a halt, laying eyes on what appeared to be a neglected cabin several dozen feet in front of me. However, the windows were covered which blocked me from seeing the contents of the interior. I came to a stop and stood to my feet, focusing on the structure from a distance. I spotted smoke coming from the chimney on the roof and I smelled it too, along with that familiar smell of rotting meat. It only became stronger as the moments had passed. Help, please. The child's voice rang out once again. I sank my claws into the trunk of the tree, preparing to launch myself forward to continue my sprint, but I felt a sudden and hard grip around my forearm. I was quickly stopped after only being in the air for less than a second and yanked backward. The right half of my body had collided with the trunk, causing a portion of it to be snapped off as I impacted and slid across the ground behind it. I somersaulted backward but quickly threw my claws out and down hard into the dirt, allowing myself to be stopped from going any further. And once I halted, I looked up, seeing my attacker who stood just mere feet in front of me. But what I laid eyes on wasn't what I had expected at all, and my jaw hung slightly agape. Nonetheless, it didn't stop my shock from soon turning into anger. There, standing right in front of me, was Dr. West, or Keller attempting to take the form of her. He looked identical to the real one with only a single change, 
that being four parallel streaks of open gashes in her throat, emulating what it had looked like when I had slashed it with my claw. After escaping her clutches when the agency had recaptured me after my initial abandonment. There, there, my child. Mother is here. She said with an insidious smile, her tone just as sinister as I remembered. But I wouldn't let myself give in to whatever emotions Keller was attempting to exploit. I've had enough of your games, Keller. I snarled before lunging forward at Dr. West and violently decapitating her with a swipe of my left claw. Her head tumbled back, rolling along the ground, as the rest of her body continued to stand upright, seemingly unaffected by the attack. I turned, looking for anything that moved. As I knew it, it wouldn't be that easy. Not with a being as twisted as this. You're strong, began another familiar voice but one that I couldn't quite specify at first. Stronger than anything I've come across before. But your violence won't stop me. I'm more powerful than you could ever imagine now. The source of the voice soon made itself known. Emerging from behind a tree in my line of sight was Keller, now in the form of Ted Bowser. The man who was the director of operations at Site 12 back when I was still with the agency. A man whose sadistic nature rivaled that of Dr. Weiss, but he too had been deceased for some time now. You see, even you possess fear, Braun, and I know what makes your legs shake with terror. He said mockingly, mimicking Ted's voice near perfectly. I dashed forward at the doppelganger before reaching down and grabbing him by the leg and proceeding to slam him with force against the tree closest to me. The body doesn't drip a single drop of blood on impact. Instead, all the limbs violently detach and go flying in various directions, either hitting the ground or other trees. You fear becoming the thing you fight so hard to destroy one day, you will realize that you are no better than the rest of us. Keller snarls, but this time his voice boomed throughout the surroundings of the forest coming from everywhere all at once. I leapt to the left and latched onto a tree, wasting no time before I scaled my way to the top and began jumping my way across the canopy, snapping off various branches in my quest to get to the cabin. I knew that it was the way out, and I was ready to endure whatever trick or display meant to torment me had been waiting inside. I far from feared Keller, and he would be nothing more than another tally in a long line of horrific monsters to feel my wrath. I was going to make sure that he paid for everything that he had done, all the pain and suffering that he had caused. I make it to the tree that was just a few feet in front of the cabin, after which I climbed down while listening out for whatever Keller was attempting to throw at me next. But the only thing that I could detect was the child inside the cabin and that same scent of rot which was now overwhelmingly powerful. I landed with my feet firmly in the grass of the front lawn. I stood up and walked up to the deck of the cabin before leaning down and delivering a hard blow to the front door, sending it flying right off its hinges and into the interior of the cabin, which I was still yet to actually see. But when I bent down under the door frame and stepped inside, I laid eyes on a sight that was far from what I had been expecting. I wasn't inside a cabin, no, at least not anymore. Instead, the interior laid out before me was that of Site 12, the facility that I had spent all my time in back at the agency. It was just as cold and sterile as I had remembered. And the completely white hallways all converged on one and another where I stood. However, the ceiling lights had flickered and that same smell of rot had shifted into one of fresh blood and lots of it too. I headed down the science wing of the building after getting onto all fours. Everything had been quiet, the only exceptions being the crawling of mice and the flickering of the ceiling lights. Until my ears picked up the desperate cry of a human male voice, coming from the other end of the building. All in formation now. This is a breach, he's gone rogue. Shoot to kill. The mystery man shouted a mix of both fear and authority present in his tone. 
I sped up, turning corners and following whatever path necessary to make it to the source of the voice. My claws sliced through the solid floor as I moved along. I knew what I was most likely heading into was another trap. This was Keller's realm after all, but it didn't matter to me. I heard the sound of several footsteps and breathing. With the heaviness of the footsteps sounding all too familiar, I could tell that they were that of field agents. The various pieces of gear and equipment they carried, all adding to the noise that they made. After only another several seconds or so, I found myself near where the noise sounded most intense. A hallway leading into the armory of the building, which in itself was a rather large room. This section of the building was one of the few locations where I would be able to fully stand upright on two legs without having to lean forward. I latched onto the wall that allowed me to peek around the corner into the armory hallway before, crawling along it and slowly peering my head over it. Toward the opposite end of the hall were several agents, all of them heavily armed and on high alert for whatever it was they were so apprehensive about. They all held their weapons in different directions, attempting to cover every angle that they could. One specifically kept his rifle pointed at an air duct opening. Mr. Bowser, do you copy? We haven't found the target, but he's still somewhere in the building. One of the agent's radios is attempt to whisper being in vain as I could hear him clear as day. They all continued to stand there unmoving but fearful. Not noticing my presence, but I picked up on yet another sound. The sound of something moving along the area behind them. And it was fast, but too quiet for their ears to perceive. Suddenly, something burst through a few of the ceiling tiles above them, and snatched two of the agents up into the space above. All of them turned and began firing their weapons upward in, in an attempt to hit the creature. It had all occurred far too fast for them to react in time with any success. The two agents who had been grabbed had their screams suddenly silenced as streams of blood came leaking down from the ceiling and onto the both remaining agents in the floor below. They all spread apart a bit more, putting further distance between where each agent stood. I tried to move forward myself in order to stop whatever it was, but I felt my body being suddenly restrained by something around my wrist. I looked down, only to find metallic, reinforced chains wrapped around the both of them. They were also connected to the wall and resembled the very same chains that Dr. West used to restrain me after my recapture following my first escape. I fought and attempted to claw at the metal, mustering all the strength that I could to simply pull the chains from their places in the walls, but it was futile. I was stuck there, forced to watch the slaughter of these agents. One of the men who had stood in the middle of three intersecting hallways was suddenly and violently snatched and dragged down the hallway by his feet, screaming for only a fraction of a second before his cries of horror were suddenly cut short, after which his said cries were followed up with a loud thud. The rest of the team darted around the corner, aiming the rifles down it in order to get a visual. Where did he go? One yells, his legs trembling as he speaks. I hear whatever it is still crawling inside the air duct just above the squad. There is a vent cover directly above one of the agent's heads acting as an entrance into the docks, or in this case, an exit. There is a moment of intense silence. I attempted to call out to the agents in order to warn them, but it was of no use, and I heard the creature approach closer to the vent as they all stood there completely oblivious as to what was soon to happen. Suddenly, the air duct is violently disconnected and thrown downward from the spot in the ceiling that it was secured immediately hitting one of the agents in the head hard enough to shatter his skull. The sound of the bone cracking traveled over to me. The remaining two agents didn't even have time to react as the creature dropped down. It was a matter of seconds before their weapons were snatched from them, and they were suddenly lifted up from where they stood, being raised several feet into the air as they kicked and thrashed around. 
However, the beast that was holding up them with its claws around their throats uh, was me, or something that moved and looked exactly like me. The only difference being that this version, if you could say it, possessed a slightly lighter blue skin than my own. You killed her. I, or rather, he growled at the two agents as he kept them held tight in each claw. I should have done this a long time ago. This alternate me then proceeds to squeeze, crushing both agents' windpipes and killing them nearly instantly. As he loosened his grip, both of their lifeless bodies hit the floor, the thud carrying out through the hall. This alternate me then shifted his gaze up to me. We make eye contact and he smiles, a large, monstrous grin that spread so far across his face that I didn't possess the muscle structure to replicate it. And after several seconds of us holding the stare with one another, he begins walking towards me, slow and purposeful. You see, Braun, you're no savior. What I've shown you here is what you truly desire, but are too self-indulged in your own hero complex to carry out. Keller says, using my alternate's mouth to speak to me. The only coward that I see is that of a killer. I snarl, once again yanking at my chains as he continues to approach me. Unlike you, I'll never stop doing what truly makes me happy. You love killing, it's what you were designed to do. Don't give in to the sentiment of being a protector. Because you're not. Keller rebuts, his voice echoing in the space around us. The chains around my wrist then suddenly snap open and I'm once again free to move as I please. So I did the only logical thing that I could think of. I crawled around the corner of the wall and toward Keller, nearly getting into a sprint as I sped up and launched myself from the wall, right toward the other me. As we collided, I tackled him. Both of us rolled over along the floor several times, before quickly recovering and running at each other once more after getting to our feet. I slung my claw, which he caught and then swung back with his own slashing me both in the chest and the face. I roared as the wounds drew blood, but I followed up with a slash of my own, before then throwing my weight forward. But Kather had used this maneuver against me, and grabbing me by the sides and slamming me into the wall on his left. I smashed it clean through the material and into the room on the other side, which was just an office. But once recovering, I stand back up to my feet, and I look over to my left, spotting a large wooden desk. I reach over and with one claw, and grab the desk and immediately sling it forward at Keller. He catches the projectile, but the resulting force in my throw causes him to slide back and the desk is still in his hands. I seize the opportunity and jump forward, putting my claws on the desk and shoving Keller back, using both my strength and the desk as a makeshift way to pin it against the opposite wall to the office room. This doesn't last for long as Keller quickly tears the desk clean in half and then reaches out and grabs me by the throat as I deliver a hard left hook to the side of his head, which nearly knocks him over. But he remains steadfast in keeping his grip tight on my throat. Now I'm going to show you what real power looks like. You will watch your world burn and I'll be at the center of it, making sure you get the honor of experiencing true failure. I reach my claws out and attempt to loosen his hold, but his strength is overwhelming. I roared and growled at him as he pinned me harder against the wall. My rage only grew with every passing moment. And despite the pain from my wounds, I didn't plan to yield so easily. I kept resisting using every ounce of strength that I could muster, but it still wasn't enough. I started desperately thinking of anything that I could do to acquire the upper hand once more. It was nothing more than a jumbled mess of thoughts as I fought to keep whatever leverage I could. My efforts were quickly snuffed out as Keller threw himself forward, using his way to smash me through the wall which I was pinned against. I collided into the other room and slid on the floor with it on my back, as dust filled and shrouded the space in a thick, almost fog-like cloud. 
I readied myself for another encounter as I watched a figure begin to emerge from the dust cloud. But I was taken aback once I had seen that it was much shorter and smaller in stature than the form that Keller had been utilizing up to that point. I kept my guard up nonetheless. However, when the figure passed through the cloud, I couldn't help but widen my eyes and unclench my claws. This being, it was someone who I thought would never be possible for me to ever see or perceive into any way ever again. Someone who was a large part of the reason that I was in the midst of making sure that Keller's plans failed. My deceased best friend, Dr. John. I was in utter disbelief and it seemed that in the moment I had lost sight of everything else going on. Every fiber in my being wanted to believe that it was more than just another one of Keller's tricks. His scent even matched. He looked well intact with no sign of wounds, scars, or any kind of physical markings that he had upon himself when he was still living. My big guy. Long time no see. He smirks, looking up at me, his voice being a perfect imitation. But, but you're dead, I say, now aiming my eyes at the floor. I am, yes, but hey, it's not so bad. Me and my little girl are in a much better place, I promise. I tell her about stories about you and me, you know. She says you sound like a good friend and that she doesn't see why people seem so scared of you. When I told her what you looked like, she asked if you were the cookie monster. Who is? I begin before cutting myself off to begin a new sentence. It doesn't matter, I know what this is. I know that you're not real. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not, but I'm just here to tell you that you need to kill this piece of crap. You gotta keep fighting, trust me, I know what you can do. Don't let him win. You're strong, stronger than anyone that I've ever met, and not just on the outside. I know that you can beat him. I keep foolishly looking at this imitation of Dr. John while too stunned to speak. I lacked any idea of how to respond. <laughs> just remember... John begins tilting his head up a bit more and reaching out with his left arm, putting his hand up just below my chest and letting it hover there as he spread his fingers, initiating a high five. The brain and the brawn. He follows up, but I fail to meet his gaze. Instead, I clench both my claws, a deep-seated rage boiling its way up inside me, a rage of which its entirety was directed at Keller for going so far as to use my dead friend as some sort of weapon against me. And although I never thought that uh, I would ever have to do such a thing, I raised my left claw into the air, spread my fingers, and brought it down on the fake Dr. John. And yet there was no actual collision, not one that I felt. I looked down in a state of confusion, seeing that there was no longer anything there in the place that he stood. He vanished with not a trace left behind. And suddenly a rush of pain shot its way through my body. I growled as a result and dropped to my knees. But strangely, only mere moments after it began, the stinging sensation of the pain had converted into that of intense fatigue, as if I had been rested in weeks. It overwhelmed me, and I soon began to feel myself slipping into a state of a consciousness. My eyelids had a way to them that I didn't think was possible. I tried to fight it, but it was no use. Instead, I simply began to fall forward, watching as I was just about to collide with the floor below me. But like my claw and John, an impact never came. I couldn't quite describe what had transpired in the following several seconds. I felt as if I was stuck in a state of being both conscious and unconscious. Everything within my vision had gone black for a period of time that I could not recollect. Once I finally did regain the ability to see, I found that I was back in the Rocky Mountains, back where I had slumped over after the orchestrator had inflicted his wound upon me, or more straightforwardly, back in the realm of reality. Immediately, I laid my eyes on Arya, who was still laying flat on the ground, not moving. A great concern suddenly rose within me until I heard the sounds of her faint breathing, indicating that she was still alive or just unconscious. Arya, I said attempting to awaken her, 
Arya, can you hear me? But there came no response, more than likely due to the fact that she was trapped in Kelly's dream state and that she would still have to fight her way out. I leaned forward, letting out a pain groan as I picked up a potent scent of blood, one that had been so overwhelmingly powerful that I couldn't help but be curious as to where it had come from. But I got my answer soon enough, as the sound of Phil's agonizing yells had originated from the same direction as the scent. I turned my head, only to see him hunched down with a limp James in his arms, and after looking closer and seeing a large stain of blood on Phil's clothing as well, as an abundance of it, leaking from between his arms where he had held his head, it became clear as to what had happened. My eyes moved to the ground, and there laid a shock on less than a foot away from James' corpse. The end of the barrel was drenched in blood, similar to Phil's clothes and now his hands and forearms. Why? Why? He yelled in a roar of emotional agony. I ignored the slowly fading pain in my gut and got up to my feet before walking over to Phil as he cradled a James corpse. I bent down, putting a claw on Phil's back as he intensely mourned his loss. I too couldn't help but feel saddened. Another friend stripped away from me so that he could serve a purpose greater than himself. But just like with John, I would be more than set on making sure his sacrifice was not made in vain. You will suffer for this, I say with a soft growl. I fully understood why Phil didn't initially respond. I could feel the emotion and turmoil radiating off him and onto myself, but from what I had been told about their bond it was close, making this Phil's loss to mourn and mine to only support but I knew the time to do that would be slim at best, as the Smither had been released and it was only a matter of time before he and his horrific creatures would enact chaos in the world if James' death hadn't done anything to corrupt the ritual. I wasn't sure how after so many deaths and my loss in power, how we would be able to defeat them. And although I couldn't let that stop me, it was difficult not to worry. However, the sounds of almost demonic, ear-shattering shrieks caught my attention, and I turned in the tree line and laid eyes upon the dentist, the chameleon, the flayer, and the whistler. All of them were in the midst of being enveloped in a black mist as they began to sink through the ground like they weren't solid beings. I watched as they slowly sank further into the earth below. The dentist was the first to fully disappear crying out in a series of horrifying shrieks as he fully went under and was abruptly silenced, never to be heard again. The flare quickly followed. He attempted to lunge an inch his way forward, but it would do nothing to change his incoming fate. He actually only sped up the process of his sinking. The mist engulfed him even further and he soon disappeared. Finally, then went down both the chameleon and the whistler, both of them even shooting each other a glance as they sunk into the ground below, both of them almost acknowledging to each other that their fates were sealed. This also meant that the Smiler, or rather Keller, was either now dead or severely weakened from having his tie to the physical world cut off, meaning that we had a chance at killing him now. Braun, Phil called out from behind, his voice cracking. I turned back, looking at him as he cradled James. The sorrow in his eyes was still ever present, and I didn't think that it would go away anytime soon. We need to finish this, all of us. For him. I heard him, I heard Keller screaming. What James did, it made him weaker. We have a chance and we need to take it. He punctuates with a commanding tone. But it didn't anger me because I more than agreed with him. I looked at him with an expression that said I shared his sentiment, but besides his horrendous soldiers, I couldn't think of a single creature on this planet who didn't currently want Keller dead. Jenny approaches Phil offering him a silent but obvious gesture of sympathy, and as she stands at his side, she turns her head to look at me, nodding her head before saying, Go and finish this, we'll catch up. She proclaims, tightening her grip on her rifle. 
I walk towards the edge of the mountain to incline and about halfway down spot the Smiler, who had, from the looks of it, shrunken down to less than a fourth of his original size, which more than likely meant that he was much weaker as well, but I couldn't be too quick to underestimate him. I turn and take one last glance at Jenny and Phil. Jenny began reloading her rifle as Phil reached over for the shotgun lying next to James. The way that he grabbed it made it obvious he more than intended to use it. Once I turned back around, I locked eyes with the Smiler, and contrary to his name, he appeared furious, specifically focusing on me with his glare of malice. His anger was more than clear, but I didn't care. As Phil and Jenny said, I needed to end this once and for all. What have you fools done? He erupts. His voice boomed through the trees as he began making his way up the slope of the mountain and towards us. I could feel the vibrations in the ground with each step that he took. His scent only became more unbearably powerful as he approached us closer. I readied myself, putting one foot behind me and opening my claws. My nails gleamed in the moonlight as I bared my teeth at the horrid arachnid. He returned my expression of hatred with a rageful outburst of his own. I'm going to make sure each and every one of you know what true, unbridled agony feels like. I'm going to tear apart everything you know and hold dear. All of you will die screaming in my hand, and I will laugh as you wallow in your own suffering. Suffering that you brought upon yourselves with your moronic and futile actions. I stand my ground not yielding as he closes the distance. Your death, Edward Keller, will be the first I take genuine pleasure in. I growl, maintaining eye contact with him just before we clash. With him still being what I perceived as a bit over ten feet tall, I lunged upwards and pulled both my claws back, attempting to go right for his eyes. But he maneuvered back and threw a leg out in front of his head, blocking my attack. I temporarily latched onto the limb, only for Keller to violently throw it backward and send me flying right off. I was only in the air for less than a second before my back at the ground with a thunderous collision. A trench had been dug out in the earth in the shape of my body, and my still healing wound made it more difficult than usual to recover. But I pushed past the pain and slowly sat up, expecting Keller to be right on top of me. Instead, I was taken aback when the roaming boom of a shotgun blared its way into my ears. I looked forward and spotted Phil who had the barrel of it pointed right at Keller, and to both his shock, mine and Jenny's. The weapon had actually affected him. A stream of scarlet red blood flowed down one of his front limbs. The smither then released a deep, ear-splitting roar, a sound that could only be made as the result of sudden agony. He stumbled back a bit, hurt but with still more than enough left in him to fight. Jenny and Phil then both backed up as Keller snarled and suddenly lived two of his legs high before slamming them quickly back down, shaking the ground hard enough to knock both Phil and Jenny off their feet. Their weapons slide several feet along the ground as the both of them roll along the dirt, after which Keller begins to charge forward in an attempt to finish the both of them off. Phil recovers from his roll and gets to his feet in order to try and shield Jenny as Keller closes in, once again lifting his limbs up and preparing to crush them. I spring into action, sprinting forward and quickly throwing myself between Keller and the two humans. I launched my claws upwards and told up both of the front limbs that he had raised in the air, stopping him from bringing them down and creating a fatal outcome. Both you, go, now. I yell at the both of them without turning around. I growl as a result of straining escapes me. Keller smiles, clearly taking pleasure in my struggle but I soon realized this would not end in my favor. I quickly let go of the limbs and took one step back before, lunging both forward and upward at a diagonal angle, gliding straight into Keller's abdomen. The force of the impact sent both of us tumbling and somersaulting along the ground. Dirt rock and other earthen materials were thrown and kicked up in the process of our grappling. It was only a matter of mere seconds before, our antics caused us both to roll over the edge of the mountain 
and begin to tumble down the incline. The speed of our fall increased by nearly twice what it did from the initial impact as we rolled down the mountainside. The both of us smashed through thin trees, tore bushes from their roots and chipped off pieces of rock formations. I was only given some sort of relief when I came to a hard and sudden, but only brief stop once my back had collided with a thicker, much stronger tree than that of those previously. But the speed with which my body was traveling had caused me to slump to the side and continue sliding down the incline. However, I was slowed down just enough to be able to throw out a claw and bury my nails into the dirt. I still slid nearly a dozen feet before finally coming to a halt, after which I pulled my claw from the ground and turned back to see Keller's position. He still continued falling a few dozen feet below me, but his speed had also seemingly decreased and he would soon recover himself as well, and I needed to do something to prevent that. To buy myself more time, I dropped to all fours and leapt over to my right to the largest tree that was within my immediate vicinity, a tree that was also in the direct vertical path of Keller. I reach it and get back on two legs and after that, waste no time as it began to slash at the bottom of the trunk in a ferocious and relentless manner with both of my claws. I made quick work of the wood and once the cuts were deep enough, and the trunk had almost been fully severed at the height that I desired, I leaned forward and flattened both my palms against the truck, before pushing with just enough force to snap it off the base and send it down the incline, headed right for Keller. Most of the thinner branches towards the top of the trunk all snapped, and they were torn off as it impacted and began sliding down in the incline like a large missile leaving a near foot deep trench in its wake. I jumped and latched onto a separate tree and immediately climbed to the top, after which I began leaping along each treetop down the incline and essentially followed the one that was barreling toward Keller. Each impact made branches snap and leaves rustle. I was sure to keep pace with the tree as it slid down the incline, ensuring that it would hit the target that I intended for it. And just as Keller had begun to get back onto all his feet and recover, the trunk collides with him in a devastatingly loud impact. Both Keller and it going another several dozen feet down the incline. Smaller trees and bushes are snapped and thrown about in the chaos, but unsurprisingly just as I had done, Keller latched in multiple legs into the ground and began to slow his descent, creating several small trenches in the dirt as a result but I was unrelenting in my pursuit. The tree had continued sliding down up until the incline flattened out at a certain point, finally coming to a stop when it rolled into two other trees with a similar girth to itself, stopping it dead in its tracks. I kept traveling downward along the treetops until I was at a distance where I could leap and land on Keller, and I did just that, throwing myself right off of the current tree that I was on, right at the horrendous looking arachnid but this time he was ready for me. Keller throws one of his front legs out forward and slams the bottom of it right into my chest, which causes him to both pierce the outer layer of my skin and draw a small amount of blood. The blunt force of the blow sends me crashing back, first through the trunk of the tree that I had just jumped from. I slide all in the dirt before purposefully rolling backward and getting to my feet in a squatted position. And as I look up, I see the tree that I had just crashed through in the midst of falling right on me. I quickly lunged myself upward and opened my claws, and in less than a second the tree collides with my palms. My feet sink a few inches into the dirt, as the force of the impact causes me to growl from the strain. But nonetheless, I keep the trunk suspended just above my head long enough for me to throw it forward. But just as it leaves my claws, Keller charges in for another attack this time running into me like a battery and ram head first. He then carries me forward for several feet before slamming me into the ground below. You're nothing but a nuisance, you've saved nothing, and you will continue to be nothing for the short rest of your pathetic life. He hisses while looking down at me as I lay there, slightly dazed from his attack. He then lifts another leg before beginning to bring it down on my head, but I snap to attention just in time and swing my right claw to the left, 
severing the bottom few inches of the limb. Blood rushes from the wound as Keller releases a deafening howl, and I seize the opportunity to return to an upright stance. I follow up my previous attack with another set of four slashes with my claws along Keller's body, drawing more blood with each. I raise my left claw to go in for a fifth, but he deflects it, before countering with several more powerful blows of his own, the last of which causes me to stumble back, but I maintain my footing, allowing me to reach out and catch the leg that he had raised in a follow-up attack, before he had been able to bring it down on me. I gripped it hard with both claws, my fingernails pierced their way into his flesh as I began to turn my body in a swinging motion. In a flash of a moment, I slam Keller into a large oak trunk. The collision threatens to snap the tree, but this seems to barely phase him, as he regains leverage over his limb and yanks me forward in a sudden jerking motion. I attempt to swipe at him, but I'm instead stopped by a sharp and sudden pain at both my sides. I look down realizing that he had slightly pierced each side of my body with a limb, the bottom of them impaling about an inch deep into my flesh. To prevent my claws from making contact with his head or body, he purposefully extends his limbs outward to keep me at a distance while he held me in place. I bared my teeth and looked down in an attempt to hide the agony that I had been in. I've never killed a cryptid before, but I'm sure you'll scream just like the little ones when I'm done with you. Kyler remarked with malice before pushing the limbs deeper into the wounds that he had created and I could do nothing but snarl and writhe as I replied. If I'm not dead, you will wish you had been more thorough. The pain continued to pound at every inch of my body. I could feel the warmth of my blood as it flowed down each of my sides and legs before, soaking into the ground beneath me. I thought that that would be it, and that Keller may have had me trapped with no way out at that moment. But that thought had subsided when I suddenly picked up on the sound of something barreling towards us at high speed, and I was at first unsure of what it might have been, until there came a scent to accompany it, a scent that I recognized to be that of Arya. Arya's supernaturally fast pounce on the Keller caused him to lose his grip on me, as the two of them crashed along the ground with Arya landing on top of Keller as they came to a stop. Without hesitation, she clamps one of Keller's limbs in her jaws, while also slashing at his face. I dropped down and leapt over, grabbing one of his flailing limbs with both hands before, snapping the bottom clean in half. After letting out a pained roar, Keller throws himself forward to get back into his feet. Arya goes flying off and crashes into a tree trunk, the force of which chips off a thick layer of wood which he quickly recovers and evades a blow from Keller by sidestepping him, after which she quickly dashed forward and slashed at his face. A streak of blood goes airborne as her claw strikes one of his eyes. You'll burn for that. He snaps, now more furious than ever. He runs in a limping fashion towards us. I prepare for an impact, only for him to slam his weight down to the ground, causing both of us to slightly stumble. Keller then takes advantage of the small moment that we weren't fully prepared, charging forward and pinning the both of us under a leg against the ground. I immediately attempted to push it off, but Keller quickly shoved it forward and it pierces its way into the flesh that had sat just beneath my left shoulder. I grabbed onto it as Keller attempted to force it deeper. Arya looked over with an expression of desperation. Both of us were too overwhelmed. It seems the Wendigo really likes you. Keller remarks at me with a sinister cackle. You failed despite all your strength and cunning. I'll be sure to take it slow with you and maybe even have her watch. She'll be there to see the mighty brawn die screaming. Keller pushes the limb in further. I growl and bare my teeth so as to not give him the satisfaction of my pain. But I was sure that he was aware of it regardless. And even in the moment where I truly thought that it would be the end of me... I still refused to hide my disdain for the monster in front of me. You're a fool, I postulate, my claws only just barely keeping Keller from making the wound any deeper. Is that all you have to say? No final words, no grand speech. I'm disappointed. He replies with a spiteful grin. How's this for disappointment? Came a sudden and familiar male voice in the near distance. 
just before the ear-shattering bang of a firearm rings out, followed by a pained groan as I saw blood begin to spill from the side of Kelly's body, presumably from where the shell had struck him. I had been so distracted that I haven't even noticed the scent of Phil, who stood less than 20 feet away to the left with a shotgun in hand. Next to him were Richard and Jenny. The latter of the two was beginning to take aim with a rifle, and by the looks of it, she was aiming directly at Keller's head. Judging by Keller's quick reaction, it seemed that he noticed it as well. He quickly maneuvered to the side mere milliseconds before Jenny had fired a shot. The bullet whips and tears through a tree behind him, leaving a sizable gash in the side of the trunk. Richard fires a few follow-up rounds with a handgun, one of which strikes Keller in the body. The sudden movement gives both Ari and I the opportunity to get back on our feet and we do just that. I of course a bit slower than usual due to my wounds, but it wouldn't stop me anytime soon. And Keller begins to charge at the group in a zigzag manner in order to avoid being shot again, and he closes most of the distance at a speed that was rather alarming to the three of them. But unfortunately for him and luckily for them, Ari and I were quick to pursue him. I dropped down on all fours while Arya pounced in rapid succession. The both of us caught up and leapt forward, grabbing onto a couple of his back legs as he slightly dragged us forward in his stampede of rage, his momentum only coming to a stop as he slides along the dirt, right in the direction of Jenny. Look out! Phil cries out before tackling and rolling with Jenny to get the both of them out of the path of Keller. Richard ran in a backward motion while attempting to keep aiming his weapon forward. Arya had lost her grip when Keller had made a sudden swerve in his slide. I retained mine but only for a second longer before I was thrown forward in a wave of momentum that worked in my favor. I soared through the air heading right for the back of Keller's arachnid body. I latch on sinking both claws into him upon impact, but he immediately thrashes with enough force and momentum to throw me right off. I hit the ground watching as Arya pounces forward and wrestles with Keller while Jenny attempts to back up for a more clear shot. Hey big guy. I hear Phil who ran up next to me in the midst of all the chaos. I stood up before looking down and he reaches behind himself with a free hand, presumably to grab an object and then brings it back around, and the object in question would be able to change the entire outcome of this ordeal. In Phil's grip, I set the dagger the orchestrator had used to drain me of my added abilities. It gleamed in the moonlight as he held it up, all the parts that hadn't been covered in my dry blood anyway. Take this, I don't stand a chance at getting close enough to him. I'm gonna get him into position and when you see the opening, you take it. He tells me hastily before handing the dagger over. I grab and secure it within my claw before turning my head to see Arya doing her best in grappling with Keller. They traded blows and slashes, but it appeared obvious that even with his injuries, Keller would emerge victorious. But another blast of gunfire erupts as Jenny finishes lining up the shot, striking Keller in the body. Phil then follows up by running forward and gripping the shotgun with his arm and shoulder, quickly firing off his shell just as Keller turns to go for her. You can join those hideous friends of yours. Phil shouts with conviction as he continues to point the barrel of his weapon right at the beast himself. The blast knocks him back and opens yet another wound where blood exited, and this gave me my opportunity. With one decent jump, I soared through the air right in Kether's direction. He didn't even appear to perceive me coming. He had been far too focused on Richard and the other two, and I thought that that would be it that it would be the end right then and there. But no, I was sorely wrong. Keller turned at the last second before lunging in my direction and bashing his body into mine. A hard hit that caused me to drop the dagger as I was sent several feet back. But he wasn't done there. He followed up by pouncing on top of me using all his remaining limbs to keep me pinned. He leans down, the rage of his face even more evident than before. You're a nuisance and I've had enough. If I'm gonna go, then you'll be coming with me. He growls after pinning my claws to the ground, and I was stuck there struggling to muster the strength to successfully fight back her after all the damage and wounds that I had endured. He raises another limb, preparing to bring it down on my head, 
and produce a fatal outcome. But then Keller jerks forward and suddenly screams. It was a sound that was not triumphant, or one out of anger, but instead one of sheer pain and shock. He spins around before frantically stumbling from side to side, still howling as he did so. He finally steps off me after several seconds as if to retreat, but is barely able to walk in a straight line. But once I get a look at his back, I see the dagger impaled within it, and Phil standing just behind where Keller originally was. He himself even seemed to be in shock, watching as Keller's limbs, both injured ones and not, began shrinking and shifting in color, and in a matter of seconds, most had disappeared entirely. The four that remained began to contort and change shape, two transforming into human legs, while the other two changed into human arms. The dagger fell to the ground as well, and Phil was quick to pick it back up, keeping it held firm in his grasp. When his transformation had finished, Keller fell to his knees in his now human form before looking up at Phil, a smile in his face. It won't bring him back. He cackles just as Jenny and Richard walk up, standing side by side with Phil. I get to my feet for the last time, Arya and I stroll over, standing behind Keller as Phil begins to aim his shotgun right at his head, and I could sense a slight bit of satisfaction in his eyes. Everything you've done, all those kids you took from their homes, all the mothers you left in agony, all the nights that I spent lying awake wondering if it would ever stop. Phil pauses. The man that I looked at like a son is gone all because of you. Got any last words before I send you back to your home underneath? You can't kill me, Keller begins. My flesh may die, but my legend will live on forever in the nightmares of children and the minds of parents, so you don't scare me with your bullets. I've already won, so do it. Get on with shooting me. Keller's eyes then lower toward the ground, and he frowns as he looks around us, like he was pretending to think deeply about his current circumstances. But instead, he remained silent before looking over at Phil and spitting a glob of blood onto his chest. Freaks, all of you, he snarled. Phil didn't react strongly to the comment, instead. He locked eyes with me and we gave each other a nod of mutual understanding. Poor choice of words, Burger Man. He says softly while putting the shotgun on his shoulder and letting it rest, silently indicating that what was to come next. I reached down with my left claw and grabbed Keller around the top of his head before lifting him up to eye level, after which I began applying just enough pressure to make him kick. Thrash and swing his arms frantically as he started to cry out in pain. I continued to gradually increase the pressure and force of my claw, which made Keller's wails only increase in volume as he desperately reached up and tried to spread my nails apart with his hands. But any force that he attempted to apply was completely inconsequential. None of my fingers and nails moved even an inch. Blood begins to pour from his head and even Jenny flinches at the sound of Keller's skull being cracked and crushed. His screaming comes to a climax as I suddenly clench my fingernails and close my claw with a sudden and great force, ending him once and for all right then and there. Keller's body goes limp as his blood splatters every which way, and I drop his corpse before looking at the three in front of me. It had been a long while since I had last eaten, and I could feel my appetite growing by the moment. You might want to look away, I announced before turning my attention back down to Keller's body. Multiple days passed, and we all returned to Jenny's farm. and We had buried James in a grave right next to John, a place that he more than deserved for his grand sacrifice. All of us mourned him, especially Phil who had been brought to tears while standing over his headstone. There is no doubt in my mind that he would be remembered as a hero. None of us would even be alive if it weren't for him. Phil had also informed me about his years of service and his position and that he was retiring. My kids are back up in Arizona, trying to get Wolf Lake out of my head and don't even want to even see another national park ever again. I'll get something worked out and find myself a place. He told us. Jenny flashed him a grin before replying. Well, you know, you could always, I don't know. 
Stick around if you like. I got plenty of room in this place. She inquires, prompting a smile from Phil. Oh, well, yes, ma'am. I'd like that a lot. He replies, clear enthusiasm in his expression. Phil had also informed me that Richard had been promoted within the agency, and that he promised to do whatever he could to make positive changes within it. But it would take time. As Jennifer and most of the current leadership had survived the events of what had taken place, mainly due to them not actually being out on the field themselves. But with all this information that had been brought to me and with everything that had happened within the past several days, I knew that I couldn't just stay put. There were other national parks out there with their own problems and monsters to deal with, and I saw it as my duty to help them, just as I had helped Wolf Lake. I had to go out there and I had to do what I could, especially if there were more beings like Keller that were roaming free, terrorizing these parks. I had asked Ari if she wanted to come along to which she agreed. Jenny along with Phil had approached Arya and me before we departed, giving the both of us high fives before stepping back and darting between the both of us with a glance. Thank you guys for saving me from Yubel. I'll be in y'all's debt. Glad I could help you kill that evil child eating lunatic. It's been a pleasure to meet you two. I'm sad to see you guys going so soon. Phil adds on. I hope you guys plan to stop back for a visit at some point. I'm grateful for your patience with my hesitance to help. I say in response. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Many time, you two make sure you take care of yourselves. Don't forget about little old us while you're out there saving the world. If you two ever need anything, always remember that you have a home here and can come back anytime you need. I'll always make sure you're all taken care of if I can help it. Came Jenny. Thank you for everything, I said. And please watch over him and watch over both of them. I punctuated by pointing over to both James and John's headstones. I will, she agreed. They're in good hands, I promise. You can be dang sure not a soul will touch them. Phil interjects. There's a bit more conversation as the evening had begun turning into dusk, which is when Arya and I had planned to leave. We were unsure of where to go first, but I was just simply happy to be with her and not have to worry about yet another threat. Wolf Lake had been freed of the burden of Edward Keller. No longer would he be able to terrorize or hurt anyone else ever again. The lives he took could never be returned, but... I can only hope that the loved ones of those he tormented could now find some semblance of peace with his death. But let them also remember the name of the man whose sacrifice was crucial in making that happen. James Parker.